There are no uh, secret words here tonight. Uh, I just am very flattered to be here this evening. Uh, I wondered, uh, of course, when I was asked if I really had the qualifications to be the moderator, having done none of this work before. So I, uh, I watched some of the moderators on television, and hoping to pick up a few pointers, I watched um, a fellow by the name of Ed Murrow, but I'm trying to give up smoking. And uh, I watched uh, the fellow in New York, uh, David Suskind, uh, uh, with Open End. Uh, well, he doesn't have Open End. I mean, uh, uh, except that I find that, that I like Hollywood, and I watched uh, uh, Mike Wallace. <laughs> You do too? I watched uh, Mike Wallace, and as I say, I'm trying to give up smoking, and I like Hollywood, and I don't want to hurt anybody here tonight, so uh, then I realized that for 13 years, I've been working with the kindly old quiz master, <laughs> who shall be nameless, because I'd like to work another 13 years, and I realized that that's exactly what I've been doing, uh, moderating on uh, the show. So uh, if you accept these qualifications, we can get started right here, right now, uh, and I'll introduce the members of our panel. And again, because this is Hollywood and you can hurt feelings, and again, you don't know for whom you will be working in the future, um, I will introduce them in alphabetical order. <coughs> Starting with Groucho Marx. George, you're fired. <laughs> now, the second letter in the alphabet, Steve Allen. Steve? George, you're hired. <laughs> and uh, next, Carl Weiner. Carl? <laughs> I fire myself. What else is there to say? <laughs> and... Uh, Last, uh, no, not last thing. Yet, uh, Cecil Smith uh, of the uh, Los Angeles Times, of course, you know. Cecil, would you come up, please, and take your place in the panel? I'll bring you this mic in just a moment. Uh, first, though, I want to introduce the man who has the unfortunate uh, letter in his last name, Y, so he is last on the list, but by no means least, uh, our award-winning follower knows best, Robert Young. Robert. I suppose you all have uh, received oh, these. I, pardon me, will you bring the piano? I haven't got an ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten this is Thursday night, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. I, Why aren't you home watching my show? <laughs> <laughs> I will, just as soon as we get this thing started. Um, you all have these uh, 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 papers with the uh, question uh, blanks on them. If questions occur to you, uh, write them down. <laughs> get him an ashtray, for God's sakes. <laughs> Write them down, and uh, we will have young ladies uh, in the audience to uh, pick them up. Uh, I think we can start, gentlemen. Uh, I'm trusting we can start. Uh, with the statement that television industry doesn't take comedy seriously, or conversely, does. I suppose you will have sides in this question. In stating the question, however, does the television industry take comedy seriously, I think we might, uh, I'm not sure I know what the question means. <laughs> so uh, if we could start perhaps with, with the idea that it, uh, it does take uh, comedy seriously, where, if it does, are they getting new comedians uh, for shows? Uh, is uh, the industry nurturing? Are, they, are there schools? Are there places for new comedians to start? Anybody want to comment on this? No. <laughs> I do because I'm unqualified. Uh, comedians are never nurtured. They, uh, where did we get these old comedians? There were never any schools for comedians. Comedians happen. Comedians happen because of environment, uh, mainly, I think, and also because of heredity, sometimes. I mean, if you have a funny mother, <laughs> or a funny father, <laughs> it's possible you'll, have, you'll live in a funny home. Uh, Mrs. Montrose had a funny boy, but I, I don't think uh, uh, comedians are nurtured any place. They happen because of society and environment. That's all. 
I think it's enough. Uh, I think that does it for the evening. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> does um, anybody else uh, have an idea? Is there, are there any other questions? I'd like to ask. <laughs> I happen to be an illegitimate son. Of what? <laughs> of Rex, the Wonder Horse. We can see the tone of this meeting now. <laughs> Wait a minute, is this being recorded? But Carl, isn't there a great complaint today about the fact that there's no place for a young comedian to be bad as soon as... Yeah, right here. <laughs> young comedian to be what? Bad. Very bad. Oh, I just said buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, just the... Well, there is no place for a young actor to be bad either, and by the same uh, token, uh, the summer theaters are much less... But isn't this a sad thing? That, uh, doesn't a young comedian come up, do one nightclub show immediately, they put him in front of 50 million people in the Sullivan show, and you never hear of him again? I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I guess... Uh, General, I'm a dreamer, but I was hoping we could get to some uh, serious answers here. <laughs> I'd like to say something serious. We're missing Walter of the Toreadors. Go ahead. Uh, very funny show, too. Uh, I was wondering if, if you feel that... You dance all the time. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't wondering. <laughs> I'm glad I had my dinner. I wish I'd had mine. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> you may before the evening, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we must remember that the question before us is... What is the question? Does the Beverly Hilton take food seriously? <laughs> I wrote some things here, but it's no use. No, no, really. No, uh, uh, that's how. Uh, seriously, folks. Uh, <laughs> I thought this would be terrible if I got this out. Do critics take comedians for granted? And I guess this would be sort of directed to you, Cecil. In other words, in reading columns, your column, other people's columns, um, do you feel that the critics devote much more, a disproportionate amount of space to... Uh, legitimate actors. <laughs> oh, we've opened up a whole new thing here. You want to take that one, Roger? I heard what he said about his folks, so I know. Um, uh, you understand? I hope you understand the question, because I don't. I... <laughs> All right, George. Does the television in industry take comedy seriously? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I suppose. What's we're... wrong? Trying to break down? down? <laughs> oh, he bruises easy. Oh. oh, oh. I can see this is going to be informal. Yeah. Uh, he when does the duck come down? <laughs> uh, we were going to use it, Steve, but even Marie Saint gave us a secret word. And we were <laughs> She's become a legend in our time. You, know. you, have, you have four comedians on that side of the table. Name me one. <laughs> Do they complain about their critical treatment? Are there any complaints about... Uh... Ooh, it's funnier over there. <laughs> well, I don't think uh, they regard comedy as much of a trick. They think uh, anybody can be funny. I think there are probably 40 good first-class comedians in the whole world. And uh, there are hundreds of actors who can play dramatic parts. And when a comedian plays a dramatic part, they throw their hats up in the air, the critics do, and they shoes and their underwear and everything. It's such a great trick and I think anybody that can do comedy can play a dramatic part. But I think there are very few dramatic actors that can do comedy. Mm. I hate to go back a number of years, but we made a picture called A Night at the Opera many years ago, which I think should have gotten an Academy Award. <laughs> because I think it was one of the great comedies that was ever made. I can say that now because it's many many years ago and it doesn't mean anything anymore. But comedies never get an award, an Academy Award. I think Billy Wilder's picture ought to get it this year. 
You won't get it. Let me some picture where they're all crying in the audience. <laughs> you watch. No comedian ever gets it. There's no prestige for a comedian except the money he gets and the laughter. But you see, the strange thing about comedy is everybody doesn't understand comedy. When a comedian goes out and he's on there for 30 minutes, he better be f funny pretty most of that time, otherwise he's a flop. Whereas a dramatic actor can go on and talk for 30 minutes, you don't know if he's good or bad. <laughs> and this is true. A comedian has to prove himself every minute when he's out there. But uh, try and get a comedian, you find out how few there are in the world. Well, that was the original question. Um, <laughs> Where are the new comedians coming from? Um, They're afraid they... to come out of the woodwork. <laughs> uh, should the networks, perhaps, maybe the, maybe the networks are not responsible for finding new talent. Uh, do we have any ideas? The networks that? claim they're not responsible for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the first things you have to do if you want to get comedians is to allow them some freedom of speech. They haven't got any. You tell a joke about a plumber, and uh, if the sponsor gets eight letters, anonymous letters about plumbers, <laughs> sponsor is frightened to death. He says, no more jokes about plumbers. But the millions of people who might enjoy a joke about a plumber, they don't write in. It's only the people who complain, and sponsors, they get terrified very quickly. Well, that's, my, that's why I think that there's no more comedy. You can't do any comedy about... Dentists, you get letters from dental associations, doctors, carpenters, plumbers, real estate. We get letters constantly, and we, uh, we're very careful. We try not to offend anybody, but it's impossible to be funny if you don't satirize or kid something. And there's very little room for this in television. So if you want to be funny, you've got to go on the stage in New York or in Straw Hat theaters or nightclubs, but you can't do it on TV. The only one that gets away with anything at all is Bob Hope, and he's kind of regarded as a sort of a war hero because he's played so many camps during the various wars. <laughs> I mean, somebody said if there isn't a war, Bob Hope will invent one. <laughs> but this but is true. Brad that's that's Steve why gets there's away a day for comedians. Brad you agree Steve? with me, Mr. Allen? Yes. Well, why don't you say something and back me up? <laughs> no, Mr. I... Mr. Reiner, do you agree with that? Yes. <clears throat> I haven't interrupted you, Groucho, just because I do agree with you. Uh, I think that uh, another aspect of the problem that's important is that the new comedians are coming along, but the nature of their humor does not uh, lend itself to television, which, as Groucho has just pointed out, is a medium that must, unfortunately, appeal to the, uh, to the lowest common denominator of taste, uh, for example, a man like Lenny Bruce or a fellow like Mort Sahl or uh, Elaine and Mike, the various people of that sort, I think are brilliantly talented. And there are other people like them uh, being discovered every six months or every year. So the real problem, as I say, is not where they're coming from. They're coming along, but I think they are, uh, the audience is lagging behind. Uh, this has been true in very many of the arts and in the sciences today in our, in our time. Uh, in the field of jazz, for example, uh, Charlie Parker, to pick a representative name, certainly plays uh, better saxophone than, uh, say, one of the uh, musicians of the 1930s. And yet very few people understand uh, his music. Uh, the same thing is true uh, in the uh, field of pictorial art. Picasso is a painter of genius, but most people don't like his work because they don't understand it. It's not realistic enough for them. Same thing is true of modern music, of modern poetry, and therefore it's not a surprise that it's come to be true now of modern comedy. I was very interested to notice that supposedly sophisticated New York gave poor Lenny Bruce the worst reviews he has ever gotten when he opened there a week or so ago. I think without exception, everybody beat him over the head. A lot of the critics walked out on him, that sort of thing. And uh, it's just, uh, as I see it, a hopeless situation unless we uh, suddenly stop all artistic progress and spend about 40 years re-educating our whole society. It's a pretty dismal picture. You've yes, it is. I want to say television gets exactly what it deserves. This is true. If they wanted better entertainment on television, all they'd have to do is watch it so the shows would get a rating. 
and the sponsors would go along with it. But every time they put on Omnibus, Playhouse 90, these shows, they all gradually disappear because they don't get enough rating. You know, they have what they call the Sunday afternoon ghetto. That's when you can see uh, Leonard Bernstein and a few other educational shows. But you don't see him in prime time at night. You don't see him from 8 until 10.30 at night. You see uh, situation comedy, you see quiz shows and shows of violence, but you don't see anything that uh, might be uplifting. Even a show like College Bowl, which I think is a wonderful show. It goes on at 5.30 on Sunday afternoon. Brilliantly, this show is, uh, and, and these kids on there are just wonderful. Now, if they put them on, I think, at 8 o'clock at night, they would disappear in a month. Of course, I don't think the audience is interested in that. There's one night, I think, where there's a 11 lessons in a row. Now, this is the average audience, and this is what the sponsor is paying for, and that's what he's buying. And that's what they're going to get. And so when critics say uh, television needs uplift, or it needs, it needs more classy and educational, literal stuff, that's true. But the critics don't pay for the shows, and the sponsors don't want that. They want a 40 rating or a 30. But Groucho, you don't want us to stop saying this, do you? What's that? You don't want us to stop saying that. No, keep on saying it, but it won't have any effect on the sponsors. <laughs> I think it's had a lot of effect over the years. Oh, I don't think so. Not at all. I think there's the same junk on television now that there was 10 years ago. No, I have, I have great respect. I really my own. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> now this Purex Corporation and the things they picked up this year. This is this is marvelous. They put on Call Me Back with Art Carney and put on the Project Twenties that couldn't find a sponsor. And later put on they put on the American, which I didn't like, but still should have been produced anyway. <laughs> last Sunday they're doing the Sac sponsoring the Sacco Vanzetti two-part documentary. And this is a, I, I, I don't know what Purex is, but I think people ought to buy it because I think this is wonderful. <laughs> these are occasional shows, but these are not shows that you see regularly every week. They're every sponsored. once in a while you may catch a good one. They've sponsored, uh, they've only missed one week out of the la since January, sponsoring a, a major show. I think you've put your finger, Cecil, uh, on the area where uh, if things are to pick up, uh, they must start. That is with the sponsors. The networks, I believe, are obviously would be quite happy to put anything on the air as long as enough people watched it or as long as primarily a sponsor was willing to pay for it. So if the sponsor is willing to say, by God, I'll take this show even though I know it'll only get a 15 rather than a, a Western that I know would get a 25, then uh, that would solve the entire problem. And if you find enough sponsors like the Purex people who are willing to do that, uh, happy days are here again. There's not enough of them. If you had, had to spend 10 or 15 million dollars a year to sell a product, you want a show that gets the biggest audience you can get. Mm -hmm. if, if he didn't do that, he wouldn't be much of a businessman, that fella, and they'd fire him. And he'd wind up on mutual radio or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to get back to... Uh, you keep out of this, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about the serious shows. Now, I'd like to get back to the problems of the comedian. Uh, none of these shows that we consider good shows are comedy shows. I mean, we're talking about the uh, Playhouse 90s and the uh, Sacco Vanzetti. And why doesn't the sponsor take a chance on comedy? And I think there's very good reasons. Um, the sponsors are fearful of offending, and comedy offends more quickly than anything else because a comedian can get out and say something in bad taste. And unless a comedian has a, a little or a lot of bad taste in him, he won't be a comedian, really. Well, that's the... It's absolutely true. Uh, a comedian must have no restriction to his taste. In other words, he, he must be obnoxious. <laughs> Definitely. And if he can be charming and obnoxious at the same time, then he is an excellent comedian. But he must be obnoxious. He must be able to do those terrible things. Now, sponsors have told the comedians, yes, be funny, but don't do this, don't do that, and don't do this. In, in the drama, they do it much less than they do in comedy. They are much more f uh, feared and fearful of comedians opening their yaps, and they are of playwrights opening their mouths. And this is true, as you know. I mean, the comedians have disappeared. Sid disappeared uh, from the general... Yeah, why series. isn't Sid Caesar on television? Yeah, I was... I Greatest just, satirist of our time. Because they took the, a lot of the areas of satire away. The you sponsors bet. said... Oh, I remember one dragged-out conference we had with the sponsor's uh, representative. We were going to do a takeoff of other products. Not other products, of a product. And we sat for three hours, and he says... 
If you mention the word ingredients, you're hurting us because we have ingredients. But I said, this is absolutely true. And we had one of the funniest satires. I'm, I, we, we laugh about it, yet when we talk about it, Sid eating some dog food. Because, now this was the, uh, this was the premise, and I, I might as well mention it because it, it, it proves a point, and I think Steve, being the philosopher, will find the point. Uh, but the point was that Sid was going to be forced, as a, an actor on television, the sponsor claimed that this dog food is good enough for humans to eat. And the, the actor heard it, and he says, watch this gentleman, and he wouldn't eat it because he heard the ingredients in it. Now, the, the sponsor that we had had nothing to do with dog foods or anything, but they had ingredients in their product. And we couldn't do it, and we fought for three days, three days, and it was thrown out. The funniest sketch we'd ever done, one of the funniest, anyway. And what does that mean, Steve? <laughs> I don't know, I thought you were talking about Groucho's dinner again there. <laughs> now, I'm going to bring that up later. <laughs> and I think that actually brings us up to another question. <laughs> Mr. Smith, yes, why sir. isn't Sid Caesar on television? Sid Caesar couldn't find anything to satirize. Mm -hmm. and why couldn't he? I don't know. Uh, a fine critic. I don't know. <laughs> What are you doing up here? You got a free meal? You're not going to answer anything? Uh, I picked up something at home to read that uh, I thought... Yeah. <laughs> Anyone read them? <laughs> but I thought was apropos of this. It, it, it is a, a piece by John Millington Singh, who wrote possibly the finest comedy in the history of literature, and who pointed out that when a people is unable to laugh at themselves, then maybe their culture and their way of life and everything else is going to pieces. Say what, of the things which nourish the imagination, humor is one of the most needful, and it is dangerous to limit or destroy it. Baudelaire calls laughter the greatest sign of the satanic element in man. And when a country loses its humor, as sometimes in Ireland are doing, and this was written 50 years ago, there will be morbidity of mind as Baudelaire's mind was morbid. In the greater part of Ireland, however, the whole people, from the tinkers to the clergy, have still a life and view of life that is rich and genial and humorous. I do not think that these country people who have so much humor themselves will mind being laughed at without malice, as the people in every country have been laughed at in their own comedies. When people stop allowing themselves to be laughed at, and dentists are afraid of their profession being laughed at, one thing or another, comedy disappears too. And also, uh, it would be nice to go to Tahiti when this happens. What's going in there? <laughs> this so does so get us. satirized Japanese movies. He had found nothing else to satirize. Isn't that right, Carl? Uh, the area's got less and less... Uh, Why? Because of the restrictions of the yeah. sponsors. Oh, I mean, but there are also personal things that go into... I don't think it's just... Hey, I don't think we should pick on Sid or mention Sid. There are other things involved, but... It, it I was lauding him. I wasn't picking on him. Well, you know, And I think as long as the sponsor is spending millions and millions of dollars a year to sell his product, he doesn't want to offend anybody. And if the a answer is, Mort's all, you don't see him on a national network. Occasionally you might. And all these avant-garde comedians, you don't see any of them on TV. You've got to go to a nightclub to see them. Is this... Uh, Mr. Smith, you have any answer? No, sir, I'm listening. I was thinking that sponsors probably feel much safer uh, by having anybody but a comedian uh, front for his product or sell his product for him. I think uh, a comedian getting out and saying Plymouth is a good car, and it is, uh, is not as telling as if Loretta Young or somebody said that Plymouth was a good... They're much more steady people. Well, she and can't I, even drive. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to pick on you, Steve. <laughs> but, but I, was just, I was just answering a question I raised, why comedians or why Sid or comedians don't have shows uh, now. I think that uh, the spokesman for a product... I mean, the sponsor feels safer if the spokesman for his product is a very steady individual rather than somebody who is charmingly obnoxious sometimes and says things that aren't always uh, uh, in the best of taste. They're suspicious of comics. Well, no one mentioned Red Skelton in that presence. 
I uh, have a question here. Oh. About time. Uh, you're supposed to be the moderator. It's right from here. our audience, by the way, which oh. I... Uh, where, is, where are they? Uh, I'd <laughs> like to add, uh, once again, that the uh, you are free to write questions, and you're liable to get an answer of some kind. Uh, this one is addressed to uh, Groucho Marx, and the question is, who, other than yourself and Red Skelton, is the greatest living comic? Uh. And it isn't signed... I don't think there's any question that Red Skelton is the great comic today in show business. I think he can do everything. He can talk, he can act, he can do acrobatics, he's a great clown, he can bring a tear to, when it's necessary. I think he's just wonderful. I think he's a wonderful all-around comedian. I don't regard myself as a comedian at all anymore. I'm just a man who asks foolish questions and rarely knows the answers. <laughs> and gives away prodigious amounts of money. And makes prodigious amounts of money. <laughs> All of which I save. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I that comes over me once in a while. Yeah, it took you a long time to find it out, though. <laughs> I, um, well, I, does that answer the question? I, what was the question? Well, it was who I other, forgot what the question who, was. Who I just had the answer. It is who other than yourself and Red Skelton uh, is the greatest living comic? Oh, there's no such thing. It's just personal. It's what you like. That's all individually. It's like asking what kind of food you like or what kind of a girl you like. It's, uh, this is a very personal question. Comedy is a very personal thing. One person will be crazy about Skelton. Somebody else might loathe them. And there's no uh, 100% on any comic. I think Bob Hope is very talented. I think there are a number of them. I think Phil Silvers is very talented. You can't say anybody's the greatest comedian. He's got a group of fellows on his show that are wonderful. There are all kinds of good, good. Carl Reiner is a wonderful comic. In support of what you're saying, Groucho, when I was doing some uh, research on this particular point a few years ago in connection with a, uh, a book project, I passed out a questionnaire to about 300 uh, people I knew. Uh, on the left-hand side of the page, there were the names of about 40 uh, prominent comedians, and on the right, there were blanks, and the people were simply to write in the names on the right side of the page in the order of their preference. Whoever they thought was the funniest, they had to put him at the top and so forth on down. And I knew that there would be some area of disagreement, but I was really astounded by the results. It was as if you just threw the pieces of paper up uh, in the air and picked them up off the floor. One person uh, would have, uh, say, Bob Hope, number one. Another guy would have him, number 29. Uh, strictly a, a matter, as Groucho says, of personal judgment and taste. Well, it'd be like saying, who's the greatest actor in the world? You can't say that. I mean, there's Gail Good, there's Grace Evans, there's Olivier. There's dozens of fine actors. Rod Steger. All kinds of... You can't say anybody is the best actor. Or you can't say Steger, either. <laughs> Who? <laughs> and he can't say Steiger. Steven? Well, Steven, whatever his name is. <laughs> we have another question here? Yeah, a sensible one this time, huh? <laughs> yeah, I didn't write that for myself. No, no, I, uh, I surmise that you had. But this uh, is for Steve Allen. Uh, what is your reason for not using a comedian? Uh, every week. Uh, do you um, disapprove of women doing comedy on a steady basis? No, but his wife does. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, my mother did comedy on a, on a steady basis. They're really, it's just an accident. Uh, we um, do use women from time to time. As a matter of fact, I met uh, a young lady named Carolyn Richter here uh, just a few minutes ago out in the lobby. She's been on the show a few times. We had a young lady on the other night named Dee Arlen. Occasionally we use uh, my mother, his professional name is Belmontrose. Uh, it just seems that uh, in general there aren't as many opportunities within the framework of our scripts uh, for uh, female characters. I think a lot of women dislike women comedians because they think it's a kind of a slander on the whole sex. They don't like, a lot of women don't like women to uh, appear ridiculous. Uh, oh, no, don't like silly, them. don't you agree with that? There's, well, there's one thing that we know Certainly, it's much, much easier to write for male comics 
than it is for women. And, it, and it's the easy way out, and you get bigger returns. Do comedy shows ever need a laugh track, which is a pretty good switch from what I was trying to say before. <laughs> Henry Morgan made an experiment one time when Henry was uh, at the peak of his popularity. Um, Henry's relationship, I guess, with the studio audience and perhaps the larger audience, too, was never <laughs> as warm as his talent uh, uh, deserved it to be, I think. And so he decided one week as an experiment to do a show without a studio audience. Uh, and I listened to him every week at that time, as did most of the people in the country, I guess. And it was a terrible show, uh, even though the jokes were on paper as good as they ever were. But just, it had a very depressing thing. It was like seeing a rehearsal of a play in an empty theater in the afternoon. It just doesn't seem amusing. You know, one thing occurred to me is, as Mr. Young was talking about watching... Mr. A Young? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> You're my father. I watch you on that thing every week. And <laughs> you know best. I feel like I got striped trousers <laughs> on tonight. <laughs> Can I call you Bob? Hi. Right. Bob. Um, I remember seeing uh, the Night at the Opera. Oh, no, were you that one you mentioned, the Night at the yeah. Opera? I remember seeing the, the Night at the Opera at the Apollo Theater on 42nd Street not too many years ago. I think myself and three other fellows were in the auditorium. And the, there was nobody laughing because there was nobody there. And it was not as funny a comedy as it was when there was an audience there. And these comedies that are made, they're made to be watched by people. And if you don't hear a laugh, you don't, you don't think it's funny. It's true. Uh, I remember some of the things that threw me down and made me laugh hysterically. Oh, by the way, on your show last night, or two nights ago, Louis Getty eaten hit with the pie. It was one of the funniest psychics I'd ever seen. I laughed. He started laughing. The audience started. It was infectious. If there was no laughter, I would have stopped laughing minutes earlier, I'm sure. I didn't see the show. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think, Groucho, we have an interesting... Uh, well, about time. <laughs> well, actually, this, uh, this is more of an experiment, I would say. Um, this person... Interesting? Uh, yes. Um, asks for a show of hands in our audience, show I would imagine. Is just just like that. that. On, no on those who watched Omnibus, Playhouse 90, College Bowl, uh, claiming that ratings are not accurate. I think it would be interesting to see here, wouldn't it? Um, in our what? academy? Uh, Have you ever seen them, you mean? Well, who, well let's, let's make a semi-honest. Um, who looked at these fair, in, on a fairly regular basis? Who liked these shows and looked at them? Is that interesting or not? Yes. Well, if it isn't, we're going to do it anyway, because I'm a moderator. Now, <laughs> would you um, raise your hands if you have at one time in your watching career looked at uh, Omnibus, Playhouse 90, uh, College Bowl? Last word. Last word, perhaps. Uh, this is being conducted very unscientifically. Yes, really. because you're lumping your hands come up. Unless right you have people with four hands. <laughs> yeah. No, I just wanted to see the hands. That's I all. I the average <laughs> audience had listened to. See if you were still there. I think he just did that to get the cigar smoke out of the way. <laughs> It gets the blood circulating, too. <laughs> I have mind not mind. a scientific mind. Steve, this is for you. There's no answer to a question no, like that. But it's, it's sort of interesting to see that people do look at these shows, people. that people say, well, nobody looks at them. You know. Except, but I guess maybe, well, Steve Allen, this is for you. Is there a place for humorous animation? Uh, uh, that is an adult Mickey Mouse. Well, uh, we all have to go sometime, you know. <laughs> You mean a rat? Uh, <laughs> I guess that would be an adult Mickey Mouse. <laughs> rat. Yeah, there's a place for everything. Uh. <laughs> Play around with that question, Steve. I'd like to answer that. The same place that there is in the theater for it. You don't go to the... Adults do not go to a motion picture to no. see a cartoon, but they're very happy when a cartoon happens. They laugh at it. Not I, necessarily. Now that's I've seen some terrible movies. Oh, yes, but I mean, it, has the, it should have the same place in television if a five-minute cartoon. I think the commercials use them very cleverly, and that's maybe the place they should be. Mm -hmm. Doesn't Huckleberry Hound have an enormous egghead audience? I don't know. Does Presumably it does. It's what like my children and egghead. egghead. What time is it on? Uh, Seven o'clock on Tuesday. Seven, that's prime time. It's a very what do you think has the television show. set at seven o'clock? The children have it. Why don't they put it on at 9 o'clock if it's so adult? They're, they're, they're now making an adult animated cartoon that will be on ABC in adult time, in prime time next year, about 9 o'clock, I think. So. I personally have no confidence at all in the intelligence of the television audience. <laughs> I think 90% of them are jokes, and that's what they see on television, and that's what they deserve. <laughs> if, they, if they had Peter Houston up playing Samuel Johnson on Omnibus, but you notice the show disappeared. 
That's what I mean, that there's no class in television. There's very little. I have no uh, respect for the television. I'm going to cry. <laughs> hmm? I'm going to cry. Yeah, that's uh, the way you put it. Well, Carl, if you'll uh, dry your eyes long enough to answer this one, do you think that the stand-up comedian, uh, Milton Berle, uh, Sid Caesar, Jackie Gleason, and so forth, will ever do a successful weekly show again? A stand-up comedian. Well, there's a paradox there. They're not stand-up comedians. I mean, uh, maybe Milton Berle is uh, Jackie Gleason is not a stand-up comedian. He's an acting comedian, and Sid is a comic actor. Oh, I'm sure it'll come back. It must. It must. Everybody Everybody else? In cycles. I don't agree with you. I wish it would, but I don't think it will. I don't agree with you either, Carl. Well, I'd trying, like to. Uh, well, let me say this. Fine, fine fellow. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll fight for this. Uh, times must change. They must, they, and nothing says that it will continue on in this parallel. It may change. It may drop. And uh, I, I, There's an interesting thought. I'd like to ask this question. Or maybe I'll just a, ask my statement. Um, <laughs> uh, comedians are born, I think, during times of stress. I think we're very affluent now, and uh, not as many frustrated babies are being born. <laughs> Frustrated children. I think uh, in, among the comedians here, there is probably a history of deprivation, frustration, and the country is affluent now. Not as many of these babies are being born. There's still poverty, and I think that's, by the way, where most of the comedians come from. Uh, I think the country's in a very good state now, and therefore, there aren't as many funny people being born at this moment. Nonsense. <laughs> that's I've seen some pretty weird looking kids lately. <laughs> I knew I was leaving it without But would you answer that seriously, Steve, or talk about it? Well, I agree with you, Carl, that uh, in the uh, history of almost every comedian, you see uh, usually poverty and uh, tragic childhood. Then again, uh, I guess that was true of most Americans uh, in, in the, perhaps, it, well, obviously it's true of most Americans even today. And uh, I think almost everyone feels that he personally had a somewhat tragic childhood. So it's difficult to, uh, to know how scientific or how accurate this statement is. But I think, in general, it's, I, I still will accept it. Uh, I don't really know that uh, things are that relaxed now. Uh, certainly, they're not on the worldwide uh, scene. As a matter of fact, if, uh, if your theory is correct, I think in about 19 years, we're going to have more comedians than we know what to do with. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Things have never been in uh, such great danger. When a, when a country is prosperous, uh, the comedian is the one who rocks the boat. And I don't think they want anybody to rock the boat now, uh, make the statements that are uh, uh, upsetting. And I think that may, that may be a reason we don't have as I much hate, comedy. I hate to inject a political note into this. I think there's a curtain of fear over this whole country. I think people are scared. Sponsors are scared. Comedians are scared. There's no freedom except maybe on open end or some panel show where they have a local show and the sponsor doesn't care too much if he gets too big an audience. But nationally, there's very little freedom on TV. And uh, somebody said, some writer a few weeks ago, he said, you're brainwashed while you're writing the script. You know what to leave out. You don't wait for the sunset mm -hmm. of the network to say, no, take that out. That's very you true. take it out voluntarily oh, yes, because you know it's going to get thrown out. Well, you can't have first-rate comedy under those conditions. Bob Hope is one of the few, I guess, the only one in the United States who can crack a joke about Washington. That's what any, and any political Washington, and any oh, wide yes. mass medium such as motion. What's that, Mr. Smith? In any wide mass medium such as motion pictures, or are the old stock companies on the stage? Was there very much freedom in writing? Oh, there was out the I sing on Broadway. On the Broadway, kid, yeah. Yeah, sure. Kidded the life out of the presidency and the vice presidency. Uh, the whole political that setup that in of the United States. States. You can still do that on the stage. Oh, Dave, but there isn't anybody with enough courage to write it. Oh, Fiorello is doing a little bit of it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's talking about the times past. Also, we're talking about television. You can say daring things in nightclubs and on record albums. Yeah, sure, of course you can. But you don't see any, Not on any comedians talking about anything significant. But, on the but motion pictures regularly. Uh -huh. But Groucho, when motion pictures were the primary mass medium, there was not very much freedom. There was not very much said. There was nobody stopping you. You could make any kind of a picture you wanted. Uh, in support of what you're, uh, I think, uh, suggesting, Cecil, Cecil, 
Uh, it is true that we can exaggerate the uh, censorship that the uh, American comedian today faces outside of uh, Sid's show and uh, Garcia's Bob Hope show and our own program. There really aren't many comedians who uh, would like to be doing this sort of thing. Jack Benny doesn't do it. Uh, Groucho, uh, in his present format, uh, no, I'm a kindly old fellow. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't do that sort of thing. Uh, Jackie Gleason Sweet. didn't do it. So that for most comedians, uh, this is really not a problem. And I don't think it's, it has anything to do with the uh, question we posed earlier as to where the comedians are coming from. Uh, I think there are probably more new comedians around right now than, uh, or as many, I should say, as there ever were. But it's just this uh, split not, between... Not on the networks, though. No, exactly. As I say, it's the split between what the comedians are saying and the mass audience. The mass audience no longer understands uh, the funniest of the new comedians. Wouldn't it be nice if a fellow like Maud Saul could go on once a week and discuss the political scenes of the United States, mm -hmm. the politics right now? I don't think Will Rogers could survive today. No, he'd be present in, condition. Roger Roger Maud is going on and, and comment on the political convention. Five okay, minutes, you mean, during the convention? Yes, five minutes. <laughs> I guess maybe what uh, the conservatives would like to, what we should do is they should cause to be created some conservative or reactionary comedians. All comedians seem to be liberals. That's <laughs> funny. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> then at least it would be even up and they couldn't... Uh, the comedian is basically a rebel. That's right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he isn't a comedian. Unless he flouts the conventions and the conditions that exist, he's not a comedian. Then he's just telling jokes up there. Why is a chicken across the street? But if he wants to comment on something, then he's going to get in trouble. Well, I think we've whipped this subject pretty yes, well. Yes, I was... I'm I glad you to, said it. Though. I don't think we've solved it, but I think we've discussed it. I don't see if there's any... Are there any other questions along those lines that we'd be glad to uh, befuddle you with? If, uh, <laughs> There's a strange question directed to uh, Cecil Smith well, in the audience. Well, this is a peculiar man, Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is... from Baudelaire, of all people, up there. I'm naive. Sing. What about Joe Miller? <laughs> Henry. Back to the uh, uh, subject at hand, which is comedy, and uh, how it is regarded. Uh, everyone in the trade knocks Jerry Lewis but he gets the ratings. Why? Signed, Dean Martin. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, Jerry always believes that when you please the critic, or he says this all the time, he says it so much that I don't think he believes it. Jerry always says that when you, when you please the critic, you lose the audience. He always threatens to do a show for critics sometime. But I don't think he ever will. Why he gets the ratings? This is Mr. Mark's answer to the to the makeup of the television audience. That's right, they're jerks. <laughs> well, I'm the moderator and I wish I weren't. He's the head uh, joke. This is for uh, Robert Young. <coughs> Mr. Young, if you know. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Young. Father Young. <laughs> Why not a training class for talent with a flair for comedy? At uh, drama classes, I guess. Now, right. Whether they mean you, you should teach run anybody to be funny. or not, I don't know. Oh, uh, oh, sponsored by studios. Uh, comedy can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing tougher than being funny. True, Mr. Rhino? You're having no trouble at all. <laughs> <laughs> Easy you, for you. Do you think there is an answer there, Bob? <laughs> no. You can't teach anybody to be funny. It's well, as far as training schools are concerned, this is a point that I think has been discussed for several hundreds of years. Uh, there are opportunities everywhere. Uh, they have to be fought hard for, and uh, people have to prepare for them. Uh, those that uh, have whatever is required, whether you want to call it talent, or guts, or luck, or something else, uh, stick it out, and they make it. Um, I, I am not adverse to the idea of a training school, but um, I, I don't see any particular need for it. I think that there are many, many opportunities uh, for the talent as it exists, and I think that uh, by some uh, process of nature, the ones with the talent rise to the surface eventually and are uh, used, get jobs, and become professional. Um, 
As far as the studio setting it up is concerned for the sake of developing talent, uh, I don't know a situation in this town that is set up in such a way that uh, they would find this um, feasible. This was done to some extent by motion picture studios, but for a very obvious reason. They were trying to develop a talent list or a contract list uh, from which they could develop their own feature players and future stars. As to uh, a television outfit doing this, uh, I think television itself is the best training school you could possibly find for young talent. That's all. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd like to say this one thing about comedy. Everybody understands the West and the fellow gets shot off a horse. He's going down the canyon or some other thing. Everybody doesn't understand a joke. You can take a hundred people and tell them the same joke and maybe 50 will understand it and 50 won't. That's a very difficult thing for comedians because everybody doesn't understand the same kind of comedy. Everybody understands drama. A child gets uh, hit by a streetcar or something. You no, know, you understand that. But everybody doesn't understand comedy. You can tell, uh, you can tell somebody a joke and you don't get any response at all. Anyway, the kind of jokes I tell them, you rarely get a response. <laughs> very good. Tell us the one about the kid getting hit by the streetcar. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was a bus. It wasn't this one. It's not a kid. There were hardly any children left. <laughs> getting hit by buses, even. They're getting shot at now by their neighbors. Uh, Steve, this one is for you. Uh, it takes a little uh, interpretation on my reading here. Um, the sentence or question is, what's with Jack Parr as a comedian? Or what's with Jack Parr as a comedian? Well, what's with Jack Parr as a comedian? Answer the first one. Well, uh, answer, yeah, tell the first three one. Three-part question. <laughs> There's a lot with him. Hugh Downs is with him. Genevieve is with him. Like a lot of people with him. Gosh, I don't know. Here again, this is a question like, uh, you know, what's your religion? It's a matter of taste. Uh, I think Jack has some very funny monologues. I think under certain circumstances, he's a very funny man. He's a neurotic man, but that, uh, you know, that's another subject altogether. Good luck to him. Who is it? Sure, right. Uh, here's one for you, Steve. Uh, what's your religion? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is for uh, Groucho. Do you think that pay TV will be beyond the control of the sponsor? Do you think that pay TV sure, sure, will be beyond the control of the sponsor? I think so. I think if they have pay TV, they don't need these sponsors. You drop money in the slot and you see the show. That's all. And you could have freedom then, because who cares whether you offend anybody or, I mean, tell a joke against one particular class of people in America. Nobody would care, because there's no sponsor to worry about it or be scared. It might be interesting, George, if you took a poll here, even though it wouldn't yeah, be an eight point the over the head. <laughs> <laughs> On that particular point, perhaps ask those to applaud who would like to see pay TV and those who would not, something that sort. Yeah, why don't we do it that way? Applaud if you would like to see pay TV happen. Now, would those who uh, are against, for whatever reasons, pay TV applaud? Not even in the minute. You have a scientific bent like I do, too, don't you? There. But that, now, yours was more scientific. I think we've... we've I'm a little more bent than you are, too. <laughs> but it looks like about 80-20 in yeah. favor of pay TV. All right, get your money up right now. <laughs> Uh, Steve Allen, would you be interested in having a comedy workshop on your program on Sunday? Comedy workshop? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We're experiment experimenting every week. Actually, we do. Uh, yes, it's about time you stop experimenting. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we do literally make a lot of experiments. Uh, nobody is, I guess everybody discovers eventually who's in the field. No one is really an expert on comedy. You go through a stage where you think you are, and it's like studying any field. The, the more you study it, the more you realize the, uh, the fact that what you know is very little compared to what, you, what there is to be known. And uh, we often uh, put uh, sketches or jokes or uh, routines on the air where we really have no idea when all is said and done how they're going to work out. Sometimes our experiments are successful, sometimes they fail. But I think we're making a, a healthy progress in that particular regard. But your show is now on Monday, isn't it? Yeah, well, that was my own decision. It was actually... Fine, Craig. He doesn't even know what night the show is on. 
No, I... I, I Give us some more Baudelaire over there, will you? <laughs> I moved out of uh, Sunday night because of Maverick. Uh, if I'd only known that Dennis the Menace was coming along, I could have stayed, you know. I have a, well, I have a, 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 a perfect example, or here's a well-adjusted man and here's a comedian. <laughs> And it's all right in between. <laughs> I know what he's doing. Well, I mean, nice I'm making plans for a new home out in the valley. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to put the pool right in there. You see. <laughs> this is for uh, Groucho Marx. Um, do you think it would be possible and beneficial to public taste to have a government art and drama commission control TV uh, to, uh, to improve the quality? I think it'd be disastrous. I think they've ruined everything they've touched. I think it would be a good idea only if Groucho Marx were at the head of it. <laughs> the average politician would be murdered. And we put the name Captain Spaulding on the outside of the door. Did you listen to some of those jokers' speeches? Are they going to tell you what's funny and what isn't funny? What's dramatic and what isn't? I think the government is in too many things. They ought to get out of most of them. <laughs> such as the income tax. <laughs> I'm telling they quit that. <laughs> went into another business. <laughs> this is for... Uh, what was the question? <laughs> I've seen you someplace. <laughs> this is for Cecil Smith. You're usually standing under a duck. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for a grown-up man in the family. <laughs> Why is uh, Kukla Fran? Oh. Why is Kukla Fran and Ali not seen on this coast? Uh, is the East a more sophisticated audience in either. humor? They've not seen any place. Not seen any place. The latest fellow has a different kind of set. <laughs> uh, no, he's got a radio. Big <laughs> radio. Oh, what Goody Ace once said. He says, "I don't have a TV." He said, "I have a radio, and I, 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 I just turn on the sound and stare at it. That's all." <laughs> Uh, this is for the entire panel. Uh, since TV is such a large consumer of comedy material, wouldn't it then be true that a comedian's longevity depends on his writers? Signed, John Hemingway. Ernest? <laughs> no, John. He's a Steinbeck's brother. Not at all. Uh, I, does it answer itself? Uh, do I we think, have anything to say here? I yes. Think so. Steve's got something to say. I just say no. Uh, the writers are tremendously important. Obviously, the average comedy show, or I, I, perhaps in these days, every show, every show uh, would have to have a tremendously talented and large uh, writing staff. But uh, that has nothing really one way or the other to do with the particular comedian's uh, longevity. And that, uh, if a particular group of writers uh, were no longer available, you would simply hire six more. I think questions of this sort uh, come out of an idea that, that jokes or humor uh, are something in supply in the sense that things like coal and oil are in supply. In other words, eventually you will get to the last drop of oil or the last lump of coal, but you will never get to the last joke because humor is not a thing. It's an attitude toward all of life. And, uh, Another absurd thing you sometimes hear said, even by people who should know better, is that there's no such thing as a new joke. Bologna, you've heard dozens of them here tonight, and they're created probably by yourselves without you being conscious of it every day. Anyone else? No, I pass. Just here, here. Uh, Robert uh, Young, this is for you. Uh, do you think time slots affect the success of shows? Wasn't your show changed several times? Uh, yes, it was uh, changed the first time because we were canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Which is as good a reason as any time. <laughs> uh, Cost time slots are important. You can get yes, uh, that, that is an extremely uh, uh, potent determining factor in this uh, uh, element called rating, which is supposed to reflect the number of people who watch the show. And therefore, it is supposed to be a reflection of the, of, the, of the taste of those people who watch the show, when actually it's merely a matter of choice. They, they have only so many shows to look at at that particular time. If they're uh, inveterate viewers, of which there are some, thank God, or I guess we wouldn't be here tonight, um, they just sit through the evening. Some of them stay glued to one channel, some hop around. 
Uh, I think uh, there's no question but what a time slot is enormously important to a show. I don't mean that it'd be opposite a week show necessarily. It could be a night particularly where uh, everything on that particular channel happens to be uh, not very popular. It's, uh, uh, let's say, a, a night that another network seems to enjoy the largest audience. So regardless of where you are on that particular night, uh, it's a bad time slot. Uh, it may be due to the show that's opposite you, the show that precedes you, etc. There are a lot of factors involved. There's no question but what a time slot is important to any show. It has a great deal to do with the number of people who watch it. I just think every show should have one, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like a nice week show, I guess. <laughs> Panel, a um, strong one in front of it. <laughs> Have him back. <laughs> Can you think of... I um, think they ought to investigate the rating system. That's what I think they ought to do. I think they ought to stop all this silly stuff, whether a jock, disc jockey got $8 from somebody for plugging <laughs> a song, and go after Nielsen and ARB and these companies who will go... Uh, they test maybe a 1,000 homes, and from that they deduce what... 40 or 50 million people are watching. It's just absurd, that's all. And the sponsors go by this. Yes, Anybody else have anything on that? Steve Marino? Well, oh, forgive me. Just to be so familiar. Oh, I'm sorry, Brad. I thought you were asleep there. <laughs> <laughs> I was dozing off. You were not off when I talked? <laughs> no, I was just toying with the idea that uh, to rise to, just to cause trouble, I'll oppose you on that one point. Uh, statistically speaking, and who the hell asked me to, uh, it, re it really is a fact that if you uh, take a sample of uh, a thousand of anything, the results will not change a great deal if you extend that then to 10,000 or 100,000. The results will change a little bit usually, but not to a great amount. But the, the ratings are different. Some, uh, there are some of the ratings that only uh, go after big cities. I don't know what that is, ARB? We uh, might have a tremendous sorry. audience in the country, and you don't get it on this uh, rating at all. Well, that's true. Well, that's, that's another factor. But I simply meant that the smallness of the sample is not something that can be held as a great sin of the rating service. In other words, you don't want the ratings investigated, is that it? Uh, no, I didn't say that. Uh, well, I thought you were. No, I said it, but you won't agree with me. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll go along I thought we were all chums up here. <laughs> Steve, you're saying that people's taste can be measured in the same way as uh, the splitting of amoebas and that sort of thing. Well, I don't never split it. one of those. Uh, it's fine. I'd like to, I mean. No. Is this the male or the female amoeba? No, the ratings have to be interpreted correctly. Uh, people usually deal with them as if they were baseball scores, which is absurd. The fact that one program gets a higher rating than another definitely does not mean that it is a better show. It may be, but it is not so because it gets a higher rating. It simply has to do with how many people watch it. But don't the sponsors go by the ratings? Oh, yes. Just don't like they, they go by circulation. Do shows drop because of they didn't get the... Certainly. It's the same thing as circulation in, in a newspaper. Here's one um, addressed to the panel. I think it's a good one for a change. It's a, I think it is a good one. <clears throat> Pretty sick of these weak questions. <laughs> Time for another joke, I think, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think... I may go into my larder and tell you a few... Knock you right out of the What is it? This is addressed to Groucho. Don't tell your joke. Uh, <laughs> this says, Don't you think that on pay TV... Who is this, who is this to? Uh, is this I, just a general question? This is a general question, oh. I think. Um, Could you isolate it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's addressed to you, but you've been oh, talking a lot. What is the address? Uh, <laughs> I probably get everybody else in the phone on Don't you think that on pay TV, the organization, that is uh, Skytron, Telemeter, or whatever, putting on the shows will try to pick shows that will appeal to the greatest mass of audience in order to bring the highest return, dollars instead of ratings. In other words, I guess, uh, why don't we write back where we started uh, before? No, because I don't think there'll be any censorship. Well, I mean, we you can tell a string of dirty jokes, but, uh, I mean, you can talk about many things uh, that sponsors today are very sensitive about. But if there are no sponsors, if you're just paying money like you go to a movie theater, I think there are many things you can do there. You take, for example, this movie, you know, this with uh, Taylor and 
cleft and, uh, you know, this. Suddenly last summer. Tennessee, uh, any, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, suddenly last summer. The men who came to dinner, you <laughs> understand is that they were all chasing Cliff, wasn't it Cliff? Yeah. And nobody was chasing her. There were a hundred Italian fellows there. <laughs> Have I answered your question? <laughs> no, but you've raised a couple oh, of others. <laughs> but you know, you couldn't put that on television. That, that uh, story in its present form. Well, I think strangely enough, and I know I'm just the moderator, but I've seen things on television that you couldn't see in a theater. Um, uh, what? Now you're going to ask me what? The Alka-Seltzer News. The Alka-Seltzer News. No, I'm, uh, I'm sometimes amazed that, uh, well, I saw the Untouchables uh, the other night. Uh, fortunately, my kids go to bed uh, a little earlier. With whom? Uh, <laughs> this, I thought, was uh, quite an adult uh, theme, certainly. Well, it's not, it's not a sex theme, is it? <laughs> Gangsters don't have any sex. I'm not going to have any me. job in a minute because I just realized this, the untouchable is opposite us. Well, I saw the show the way I can say months ago. Uh, now, Mr. Young, let's get back to sanity here. Uh, why do you think? Uh, why do you think your show is successful? I've often wondered. <laughs> You know, Groucho, I have too. <laughs> uh, I suppose it would be uh, fatuous to say I'm just grateful, but uh, um, I frankly don't know, to tell you the truth. I, uh, I could uh, uh, spout off a lot of uh, old kind of um, obvious pat things. Uh, I suppose it's because there's a kind of an identification with the family, and um, uh, what they do is, uh, we hope, amusing. And um, there is uh, a kind of vicarious participation with that family. That's the only reason I can figure out. Other than that, I never ask any questions. I just ask <laughs> Rodney how we're doing, and that's as far as I go. George has asked me to ask this question because it's directed at him. How do you put up with Groucho? <laughs> I didn't like <laughs> Well, he only sees me once a week. <laughs> uh, uh, he was he doesn't see me at all. <laughs> We well, do have that to look forward to. Well, okay. yes. <laughs> do you uh, when you get lonely for me? Do you run a residual? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Allen, do you feel that too many writers on a single comedy show can do more harm than good? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> the more, the merrier. That's right. That's uh, what Bob Hope says. Really? Bob well, what is he know? Ten. <laughs> We only have eight, but uh, I think that's we'll get too many. <laughs> I, I, the only reason we only have eight, actually, is we ran out of uh, writers' budget money at that point. I'd have 50 writers if I could afford them. Steve, this is the, the uh, question, man. Steve, the answer is Groucho Marx. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, who's the funniest man at this table? I told you. I told you. I have a number of notes here that I guess we're not going to get time to get to because I have one addressed to me that says get off while we're ahead. Do is watch it so the shows would get a rating and the sponsors would go along with it. But every time they put on Omnibus, Playhouse 90, these shows, they all gradually disappear because they don't get enough rating. You know, they have what they call the Sunday afternoon ghetto. That's when you can see uh, Leonard Bernstein and a few other educational shows. But you don't see him in prime time at night. You don't see him from 8 until 10.30 at night. You see uh, situation comedy. You see quiz shows and shows of violence. But you don't see anything that uh, might be uplifting. Even a show like College Bowl, which I think is a wonderful show. It goes on at 5.30 on Sunday afternoon. Brilliantly, this show is, uh, and, and these kids on there are just wonderful. Now, if they put them on, I think, at 8 o'clock at night, they would disappear in a month. Because I don't think the audience is interested in that. There's one night, I think, where there's a, 11 lessons in a row. Now, this is the average audience, and this is what the sponsor is paying for, and that's what he's buying. And that's what they're going to get. And so when critics say uh, television needs uplift, or it needs 
It needs more classy and educational, literal stuff. That's true. But the critics don't pay for the shows, and the sponsors don't want that. They want a 40 rating or a 30. But, Groucho, you don't want us to stop saying this, do you? What's that? You don't want us to stop saying that. No, keep on saying it, but it won't have any effect on the sponsors. I think it's had a lot of effect over the years. Oh, I don't think so. Not at all. I think there's the same junk on television now that there was 10 years ago. No, I have, I have great respect. I'm my own. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> now this Purex Corporation and the things they picked up this year. This is this is marvelous. They put on Call Me Back with Art Carney and put on the Project Twenties that couldn't find a sponsor and later put on they put on the American which I didn't like but still should have been produced anyway <laughs> last Sunday. They're doing the Sac sponsoring the Sacco Vanzetti two part documentary. And this is a, I, I, I don't know what Purex is, but I think people ought to buy it because I think this is wonderful. <laughs> these are occasional shows, but these are not shows that you see regularly every week. They're every sponsored. once in a while you may catch a good one. They've sponsored, uh, they've only missed one week out of the last, since January, sponsoring a, a major show. I think you've put your finger, Cecil, uh, on the area where uh, if things are to pick up, uh, they must start. That is with the sponsors. The networks, I believe, are obviously would be quite happy to put anything on the air as long as enough people watched it or as long as primarily a sponsor was willing to pay for it. So if the sponsor is willing to say, by God, I'll take this show even though I know it'll only get a 15 rather than a, a Western that I know would get a 25, then uh, that would solve the entire... If you have a funny mother <laughs> or a funny father, <laughs> it's possible you'll, have, you'll live in a funny home. Mrs. Montrose had a funny boy, but I, I don't think uh, uh, comedians are nurtured any place. They happen because of society and environment. That's all. Funny is enough. Uh, I think that does it for the evening. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> does uh, anybody else uh, have an idea? Oh, I have any other question? I'd like to. Ask <laughs> <laughs> I happen to be an illegitimate son. <laughs> The Wonder Horse. <laughs> well, we can see the tone of this meeting now. <laughs> Wait a minute, is this being recorded? <laughs> but Carl, isn't there a great complaint today about the fact that there's no place for a young comedian to be bad as soon as... Yeah, right here. here. <laughs> young comedian to be what? Bad. There is. Bad. Oh, they said buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, just the... Well, there is no place for a young actor to be bad either, and by the same uh, token, uh, the summer theaters are much less... But isn't this a sad thing? To, uh, doesn't a young comedian come up, do one nightclub show immediately, they put him in front of 50 million people in the Sullivan show, and you never hear of him again? I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> General, I'm a dreamer, but I was hoping we could get to some uh, serious answers here. <laughs> I'd like to say something serious. We're missing Walter the Toreadors. Go ahead. Uh, Very funny show, too. Uh, I was wondering if, if you feel that... You dance all the time. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't wondering. <laughs> I'm glad I had my dinner. I wish I'd had mine. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> you may before the evening's over. <laughs> the, uh, I think we must remember that the question before us is... What is the question? Does the Beverly Hilton take food seriously? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I wrote some things here, but it's no use. No, no, really. No, uh, uh, that's how. Uh, seriously, folks. Uh, <laughs> I thought this would be terrible if I got this out. Do critics take comedians for granted? And I guess this would be sort of directed to you, Cecil. In other words, in reading columns, your column, other people's columns, um, do you feel that the critics devote much more, a disproportionate amount? Would, but I don't think it will. I don't agree with you either. Well, I'd time. like to. Uh, well, let me say this. Fine, fine, fine. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll fight for this. Uh, times must change. 
And nothing says that it will continue on in this parallel. It may change, it may drop. And uh, I, there's an interesting thought. I'd like to ask this question. Or maybe I'll just ask my statement. Um, <laughs> uh, comedians are born, I think, during times of stress. I think we're very affluent now, and uh, not as many frustrated babies are being born. <laughs> frustrated children. I think uh, in, among the comedians here, there is probably a history of deprivation, frustration, and the country is affluent now. Not as many of these babies are being born. There's still poverty, and I think that's, by the way, where most of the comedians come from. Uh, I think the country's in a very good state now, and therefore, there aren't as many funny people being born at this moment. Nonsense. <laughs> That's I've seen some pretty weird-looking kids lately. <laughs> I knew I was leaving it around. Well, would you answer that seriously, Steve, or talk about it? Well, I agree with you, Carl, that uh, in the uh, history of almost every comedian, you see uh, usually poverty and uh, tragic childhood. Then again, uh, I guess that was true of most Americans uh, in, in the... Perhaps it well obviously it's true of most Americans even today, and uh, I think almost everyone feels that he personally had a somewhat tragic childhood. So it's difficult to uh, to know how scientific or how accurate the statement is. But I think in general, it's, I, I still will accept it. Uh, I don't really know that uh, things are that relaxed now. Uh, certainly, they're not on the worldwide uh, scene. As a matter of fact, if uh, if your theory is correct, I think in about 19 years, we're going to have more comedians than we know what to do with. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Things have never been in uh, such great danger. Well, when, a, when a country is prosperous, uh, the comedian is the one who rocks the boat. And I don't think they want anybody to rock the boat now, uh, make the statements that are uh, uh, upsetting. And I think that may, that may be a reason we don't have as I much hate comedy. To, I hate to inject a political note into this. I think there's a kind of fear over this whole country I think people are scared. Sponsors are scared. Comedians are scared. There's no freedom except maybe on Open End or some panel show where they have a local show and the sponsor doesn't care too much if he gets too big an audience. But nationally, there's very little freedom on TV. And uh, somebody said, some writer a few weeks ago, he said, your brainwash while you're writing the script. You know what to leave out. You don't wait for the sunset uh -huh. of the net. Unqualified. Uh, <laughs> comedians are never nurtured. They, uh, where did we get these old comedians? There were never any schools for comedians. Comedians happen. Comedians happen because of environment, uh, mainly, I think, and also because of heredity, sometimes. I mean, if you have a funny mother, <laughs> or a funny father, it's possible you'll, have, you'll live in a funny home. Uh, Mrs. Montrose had a funny boy. But I, I don't think uh, uh, comedians are nurtured any place. They happen because of society and environment. That's all. Funny well, is enough. Uh, I think that does it for the evening. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> does uh, anybody else uh, have an idea? Oh, I have any other question. I'd like to ask... <laughs> I happen to be an illegitimate son, now. Of what? Of Rex, the Wonder Horse. <laughs> well, we can see the tone of this meeting now. <laughs> Wait a minute, is this being recorded? But Carl, isn't there a great complaint today about the fact that there's no place for a young comedian to be bad as soon as... Yeah, right here. here. <laughs> young comedian to be what? There. There is. Yeah, no, I think it's buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, just the... Well, there is no place for a young actor to be bad either, and by the same uh, token, uh, the summer theaters are much less... But isn't this a sad thing? That, uh, doesn't a young comedian come up, do one nightclub show immediately, they put him in front of 50 million people in the Sullivan show, and you never hear of him again? I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Uh, General, I'm a dreamer, but I was hoping we could get to some uh, serious answers here. <laughs> I'd like to say something serious. We're missing Walter the Toreadors. Go ahead. Uh, very funny show, too. 
Uh, I was wondering if, if you feel that... You dance all the time. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't wondering. <laughs> I'm glad I had my dinner. Uh, I wish I'd had mine. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> You may before the evening's over. Right? <laughs> the uh, I think we must remember that the question before us is what is the question? Does the Beverly Hilton take food seriously? <laughs> I don't, uh, I wrote some things here, but it's no use. No, no, really. No, uh, uh, that's how. Uh, seriously, folks. Uh, <laughs> out and say something in bad taste, and unless a comedian has a, a little or a lot of bad taste in him, he won't be a comedian, really. Well, that's the... It's absolutely true. Uh, a comedian must have no restriction to his taste. In other words... He you must be obnoxious. obnoxious. <laughs> Definitely. And if he can be charming and obnoxious at the same time, then he is an excellent comedian. But he must be obnoxious. He must be able to do those terrible things. Now, sponsors have told the comedians, Yes, be funny, but don't do this, don't do that, and don't do this. In, in the drama, they do it much less than they do in comedy. They're much more f uh, feared and fearful of comedians opening their yaps than they are of playwrights opening their mouths. And this is true, as you know. I mean, the comedians have disappeared. Sid disappeared uh, from the general. Yeah, why season. isn't Sid Caesar on television? Yeah, I was I greatest guess. satirist of our time. Because they took the, a lot of the areas of satire away. The you sponsors bet. said... Oh, I remember one dragged out conference we had with the sponsor's uh, representative. We were going to do a takeoff of other products, not other products, of a product. And we sat for three hours and he says, if you mention the word ingredients, you're hurting us because we have ingredients. But I said, this is absolutely true. And we had one of the funniest satires. I'm, I, we, we laugh about it, yet when we talk about it, Sid eating some dog food because... Now, this was, the, uh, this was the premise, and I, I might as well mention it because it, it, it proves a point, and I think Steve, being the philosopher, will find the point. Uh, but the point was that Sid was going to be forced, as a, an actor on television, the sponsor claimed that this dog food is good enough for humans to eat. And the, the actor heard it, and he says, watch this gentleman, and he wouldn't eat it because he heard the ingredients in it. Now, the, the sponsor that we had had nothing to do with dog foods or anything, but they had ingredients in their product. And we couldn't do it, and we fought for three days. Three days. And it was thrown out. The funniest sketch we'd ever done. One of the funniest, anyway. And what does that mean, Steve? <laughs> I don't know. I thought you were talking about Groucho's dinner again. <laughs> now, I'm going to bring that up later. <laughs> Actually brings us up to another question. <laughs> Mr. Smith, yes, why sir. isn't Sid Caesar on television? Sid Caesar couldn't find anything to satirize. Mm -hmm. And why couldn't he? I don't know. Uh, well, you're a fine critic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing up here? You get a free meal, you're not gonna answer anything? Uh, I picked up something at home to read that uh, up I here? thought. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone we know? <laughs> but I thought it was apropos of this. It, it, it is a, a piece by John Millington Singh, who wrote possibly the finest comedy in the history of literature, and who pointed out that when a people... F Bad taste in him, he won't be a comedian, really. Well, that's the... It's absolutely true. Uh, a comedian must have no restriction to his taste. In other words... You must be obnoxious. <laughs> Definitely. And if he can be charming and obnoxious at the same time, then he is an excellent comedian. But he must be obnoxious. He must be able to do those terrible things. Now, sponsors have told the comedians, yes, be funny, but don't do this, don't do that, and don't do this. In, in the drama, they do it much less than they do in comedy. They're much more f uh, feared and fearful of comedians opening their yaps than they are of playwrights opening their mouths. And this is true, as you know. I mean, the comedians have disappeared. Sid disappeared uh, from the general. Yeah, why season. isn't Sid Caesar on television? Yeah, I was the greatest I satirist of our time. Because they took the, a lot of the areas of satire away. The you sponsors bet. said, oh, I remember one dragged out conference we had with the sponsor's uh, representative. We were going to do a takeoff of other products, not other products, of a product. And we sat for three hours, and he says, if you mention the word ingredients, you're hurting us because we have ingredients. But I said, this is absolutely true. 
And we had one of the funniest satires. I'm, I, we, we laugh about it, yet when we talk about it, Sid eating some dog food. Because, now this was the, uh, this was the premise, and I, I might as well mention it because it, it, it proves a point, and I think Steve, being the philosopher, will find the point. Uh, <laughs> but the point was that Sid was going to be forced, as a, an actor on television, the sponsor claimed that this dog food is good enough for humans to eat. And the, the actor heard it, and he says, watch this gentleman, and he wouldn't eat it because he heard the ingredients in it. Now, the, the sponsor that we had had nothing to do with dog foods or anything, but they had ingredients in their product. And we couldn't do it, and we fought for three days. Three days. And it was thrown out. The funniest sketch we'd ever done. One of the funniest, anyway. And what does that mean, Steve? <laughs> I don't know. I thought you were talking about Groucho's dinner again there. <laughs> now, I'm going to bring that up later. <laughs> actually brings us up to another question. <laughs> Mr. Smith, yes, why sir. isn't Sid Caesar on television? Sid Caesar couldn't find anything to satirize. Mm -hmm. and why couldn't he? I don't know. Uh, well, you're a fine critic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing up here? You got a free meal? You're not going to answer anything? Uh, I picked up something at home to read that uh, I thought... Yeah. <laughs> Anyone we know? <laughs> but I thought it was apropos of this. It, it, it is a, a piece by John Millington Singh, who wrote possibly the finest comedy in the history of literature, and who pointed out that when a people f is unable to laugh at themselves, then maybe their culture and their... Certainly. It's the same thing as circulation in, in a newspaper. Here's one um, addressed to the panel. I think it's a good one for a change. A, I think it is a good one. <clears throat> Pretty sick of these weak questions. <laughs> Time for another joke, I think, Roger. <laughs> Don't you think... I may go into my larder and tell you a few... Knock you right out of the <laughs> What is it? This is addressed to Groucho. Don't tell your joke. Uh, <laughs> This says, don't you think that on pay TV... Who is this, who is this to? Uh, is this just a general question? This is a general question, oh. I think. Um, Could you have isolated it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's addressed to you, but you've been oh. talking a lot. What is the address? Uh, <laughs> so I thought we'd get everybody else in the phone on the <laughs> um, Don't you think that on pay TV, the organization, that is uh, Skytron, Telemeter, or whatever, putting on the shows will try to pick shows that will appeal to the greatest mass of audience in order to bring the highest return, dollars instead of ratings. In other words, I guess, uh, why don't we write back what we started uh, before? No, because I don't think there'll be any censorship. Well, I we, mean, we you lose can't censorship. Up tell a string of dirty jokes, but uh, I mean, you can talk about many things uh, that sponsors today are very sensitive about. <laughs> But if there are no sponsors, if you're just paying money like you go to a movie theater, I think there are many things you can do there. You take, for example, this movie, you know, this with uh, Taylor and Clift and, uh, you know, this Tennessee, uh, Tennessee, any, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, suddenly last summer. The men who came to dinner, you <laughs> <laughs> understand is that they were all chasing Cliff, wasn't it Cliff? Yeah. And nobody was chasing her. There were a hundred Italian fellows there. <laughs> Have I answered your question? <laughs> no, but you've raised a couple oh, of others. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you couldn't put that on television. That, that uh, story in its present form. Well, I think strangely enough, and I know I'm just the moderator, but I've seen things on television that you couldn't see in a theater. Um, uh, what? Now you're going to ask I mean, me what? Yeah, the Alka-Seltzer news. <laughs> <laughs> the Alka-Seltzer news. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm sometimes amazed that, uh, well, I saw the Untouchables uh, the other night. Uh, fortunately, my kids go to bed uh, a little earlier. With whom? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, I thought, was uh, quite an adult uh, theme, certainly. Well, it's not, it's not a sex theme, is it? <laughs> Gangsters don't have any sex. I'm not going to have any job in a minute because I just realized this, the untouchables are opposite us. Well, I saw the show. The way out, I'll take this show, even though I know it'll only get a 15 rather than a, a Western that I know would get a 25. 
then uh, that would solve the entire problem. And if you find enough sponsors like the Purex people who are willing to do that, uh, happy days are here again. There's not enough of them. If you had, had to spend 10 or $15 million a year to sell a product, you want to show that it gets the biggest audience you can get. Mm -hmm. if, if he didn't do that, he wouldn't be much of a businessman, that fella, and they'd fire him. And he'd wind up on mutual radio or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd like to get back to... Uh, you keep out of this, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're talking about serious shows. Now, I'd like to get back to the problems of the comedian. Uh, none of these shows that we consider good shows are comedy shows. I mean, we're talking about the uh, Playhouse 90s and the uh, Sacco Vanzetti. And why doesn't the sponsor take a chance on comedy? And I think there's very good reasons. Um, the sponsors are fearful of offending, and comedy offends more quickly than anything else because a comedian can get out and say something in bad taste. And unless a comedian has a, a little or a lot of bad taste in him, he won't be a comedian, really. Well, that's the... <laughs> it's absolutely true. Uh, a comedian must have no restriction to his taste. In other words, he must be obnoxious. <laughs> Definitely. And if he can be charming and obnoxious at the same time, then he is an excellent comedian. But he must be obnoxious. He must be able to do those terrible things. Now, sponsors have told the comedians, yes, be funny, but don't do this, don't do that, and don't do this. In, in the drama, they do it much less than they do in comedy. They are much more f uh, feared and fearful of comedians opening their yaps, and they are of playwrights opening their mouths. And this is true, as you know. I mean, the comedians have disappeared. Sid disappeared uh, from the general yeah, why isn't Sid Caesar on television? Yeah, I was... I Greatest satirist of our time. Because they took the, a lot of the areas of satire away. The you sponsors bet. said... Oh, I remember one dragged-out conference we had with the sponsor's uh, representative. We were going to do a takeoff of other products. Not other products, of a product. And we sat for three hours, and he says, if you mention the word ingredients, you're hurting us because we have ingredients. But I this is absolutely true. And we had one of the funniest satires. I'm, I, we, we laugh about it, yet when we talk about it, Sid eating some dog food. Because, now this was the, this was the premise, and I, I might as well mention it because it, it, it proves a point, and I think Steve, being the philosopher, will find the point. Uh, but the point was that Sid was going to be forced, as a, an actor on television, the sponsor claimed that this dog food is good enough for humans to eat. And the, the actor heard it and he says, watch this gentleman. And he wouldn't eat it because he heard the ingredients in it. Now, the, the sponsor that we had had nothing to do with dog foods or anything, but they had ingredients in their product. And we couldn't do it and we fought for three days, three days, and it was thrown out. The funniest sketch we'd ever done, one of the funniest. Steve, uh, what's your religion? Uh, <laughs> This is for uh, Groucho. Do you think that pay TV will be beyond the control of the sponsor? Do you think that pay TV sure, sure, will be beyond the control of the sponsor? I think so. I think if they have pay TV, they don't need any sponsors. You drop money in the slot and you see the show. That's all. And you could have freedom then because who cares whether you offend anybody or, I mean, tell a joke against one particular class of people in America. Nobody would care because there's no sponsor to worry about it or be scared. It might be interesting, George, if you took a poll here, even though it wouldn't yeah, be an the audience over their head. <laughs> <laughs> On that particular point, perhaps ask those to applaud who would like to see pay TV and those who would not, something that sort. Yeah, why don't we do it that way? Applaud if you would like to see pay TV. <laughs> now, would those who uh, are against, for whatever reasons, pay TV applaud? You have a scientific bent like I do, too, don't you? There. But that, yeah, yours was more scientific. I think we... we I'm a little more than you are, too. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like about 80-20 in yeah. favor of pay TV. All right, get your money up right now. <laughs> uh, Steve Allen, would you be interested in having a comedy workshop on your program on Sunday? Comedy workshop? He has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We're, we're experiment, experimenting every week. Actually, we do. Uh, yes, it's about time you stop experimenting. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we do literally make a lot of experiments. Uh, nobody is, I guess everybody discovers eventually who's in the field, no one is really an expert on comedy. You go through a stage where you think you are, and it's like studying any field. The, the more you study it, the more you realize the... Uh, the fact that what you know is very little compared to what you what there is to be known. And uh, we often uh, put uh, sketches or jokes or uh, routines on the air 
where we really have no idea when all is said and done how they're going to work out. Sometimes our experiments are successful, sometimes they fail, but I think we're making a, a healthy progress in that particular regard. But your show is now on Monday, isn't it? Yeah, well, that was my own decision. It was actually... Fine Craig doesn't even know what night the show is on. <laughs> No, I... I, I Give us another boat of that over there, will you? <laughs> I moved out of uh, Sunday night because of Maverick. Uh, if I'd only known that Dennis the Menace was coming along, I could have stayed, you know. I have a, well, I have a, 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 a perfect example, or here's a well-adjusted man and here's a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a right in between. <laughs> Doing well, I mean, you're nice I'm making you're plans for a new home out in the valley. Well. <laughs> We're going to put the pool right in there. You see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right there. <laughs> Young comedian to be what? There. There is. Yeah, no, I think it's buried. <laughs> well, just the. Well, there is no place for a young actor to be bad either, and by the same token, uh, the summer theaters are much less... But isn't this a sad thing? That, uh, doesn't a young comedian come up, do one nightclub show, immediately they put him in front of 50 million people in the Sullivan show, and you never hear of him again? I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Uh, General, I'm a dreamer, but I was hoping we could get to some uh, serious answers here. <laughs> I'd like to say something serious. We're missing Walter of the Toreadors. Go ahead. Uh, very funny show, too. Uh, I was wondering if, if you feel that... You dance all the time. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't wondering. <laughs> I'm glad I had my dinner. I wish I'd have had mine. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> you may before the evening's over. <laughs> uh, I think we must remember that the question before us is... What is the question? Does the Beverly Hilton take food seriously? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I wrote some things here, but it's no use. No, no, really. No, no uh, uh, that's how. Uh, seriously, folks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought this would be terrible if I got this out. Do critics take comedians for granted? And I guess this would be sort of directed to you, Cecil. In other words, in reading columns, your column, other people's columns, um, do you feel that the critics devote much more, a disproportionate amount of space to... Uh, legitimate actors. <laughs> oh, we've opened up a whole new thing here. You want to take that line, Roger? Uh, I heard what he said about his folks, so I know. Um, uh, you understand? I hope you understand the question, because I don't. I, uh, <laughs> All right, George. Does the television in industry take comedy seriously? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I suppose. What's we're man? Fenneman breakdown? <laughs> oh, he bruises easy. Oh. oh, oh. Because I can see this is going to be informal. Yeah. Uh, you can use When does the duck come down? <laughs> uh, we were going to use it, Steve, but even Marie Saint gave us a secret word. And we're <laughs> She's become a legend in our time. You, know. <laughs> you, have, you have four comedians on that side of the table. Name me one. <laughs> Doctors, carpenters, plumbers, real estate. We get letters constantly. And we, uh, we're very careful. We try not to offend anybody, but it's impossible to be funny if you don't satirize or kid something. And there's very little room for this in television. So if you want to be funny, you've got to go on the stage in New York or in Straw Hat theaters or nightclubs, but you can't do it on TV. The only one that gets away with anything at all is Bob Hope. And he's kind of regarded as a sort of a war hero because he's played so many camps during the various wars. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somebody said if there isn't a war, Bob Hope will invent one. <laughs> but this but is true. That's, that's why there's a day for comedians. Do you agree with me, Mr. Allen? Yes. Well, why don't you say something and back me up? <laughs> no, Mr. I'm... Reiner, do you agree with that? Yes. <clears throat> I haven't interrupted you, Groucho, just because I do agree with you. 
Uh, I think that uh, another aspect of the problem that's important is that the new comedians are coming along, but the nature of their humor does not uh, lend itself to television, which, as Groucho has just pointed out, is a medium that must, unfortunately, appeal to the, uh, to the lowest common denominator of taste. Uh, for example, a man like Lenny Bruce or a fellow like Mort Sahl or uh, Belaine and Mike, the various people of that sort, I think are brilliantly talented. And there are other people like them uh, being discovered every six months or every year. So the real problem, as I say, is not where they're coming from. They're coming along, but I think they are, uh, the audience is lagging behind. Uh, this has been true in very many of the arts and in the sciences today in our, in our time. Uh, in the field of jazz, for example, uh, Charlie Parker, to pick a representative name, certainly plays uh, better saxophone than, uh, say, one of the uh, musicians of the 1930s. And yet very few people understand uh, his music. Uh, the same thing is true uh, in the uh, field of pictorial art. Picasso is a painter of genius, but most people don't like his work because they don't understand it. It's not realistic enough for them. Same thing is true of modern music, of modern poetry. And therefore, it's not a surprise that it's come to be true now of modern comedy. I was very interested to notice that supposedly sophisticated New York gave poor Lenny Bruce the worst reviews he has ever gotten when he opened there a week or so ago. I think without exception, everybody beat him over the head. A lot of the critics walked out on him, that sort of thing. And uh, it's just, uh, as I see it, a hopeless situation unless we uh, suddenly stop all artistic progress and spend about 40 years re-educating our whole society. It's a pretty dismal picture. Of, I know. <laughs> of what? <laughs> of Rex, the Wonder Horse. <laughs> well, we can see the tone of this meeting now. <laughs> Is this being recorded? <laughs> but Carl, isn't there a great complaint today about the fact that there's no place for a young comedian to be bad as soon as... Yeah, right here. here. <laughs> young comedian to be what? Bad. There is. Bad. Oh, they said buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, just the... Well, there is no place for a young actor to be bad either, and by the same uh, token, uh, the summer theaters are much less... But isn't this a sad thing? That, uh, doesn't a young comedian come up, do one nightclub show immediately, they put him in front of... 50 million people in the Sullivan show and you never hear of them again. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I guess, uh, General, I'm a dreamer, but I was hoping we could get to some uh, serious answers here. <laughs> I'd like to say something serious. We're missing Walter the Toreadors. Go ahead. Uh, Very funny show, too. Uh, I was wondering if, if you feel that... You dance all the time. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't wondering. <laughs> I'm glad I had my dinner. <laughs> I wish I'd had mine. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> you may before the evening's over. <laughs> Remember that the question before us is, what is the question? Does the Beverly Hilton take food seriously? <laughs> I, uh, I wrote some things here, but it's no use. No, no, really. No, uh, uh, that's how. Uh, seriously, folks. Uh, <laughs> I thought this would be terrible if I got this out. Do critics take comedians for granted? And I guess this would be sort of directed to you, Cecil. In other words, in reading columns, your column, other people's columns, um, do you feel that the critics devote much more, a disproportionate amount of space to uh, legitimate actors? <laughs> oh, we've opened up a whole new thing here. You want to take that one, Roger? Uh, I heard what he said about his folks, so I know. Um, uh, you understand, I hope you understand the question, because I don't. I, I don't. <laughs> All right. George, does the television in industry take comedy seriously? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I suppose What's we're... What's the matter? Fenneman Breakdown? Boy, he bruises easy. Oh. Oh. Because oh. yeah. oh. I can see this is going to be informal. Yeah. Uh, you can use
In support of what you're saying, Groucho, when I was doing some uh, research on this particular point a few years ago in connection with a uh, book project, I passed out a questionnaire to about 300 uh, people I knew. Uh, on the left-hand side of the page, there were the names of about 40 uh, prominent comedians, and on the right, there were blanks, and the people were simply to write in the names on the right side of the page in the order of their preference. Whoever they thought was the funniest, they had to put him at the top and so forth on down. And I knew that there would be some area of disagreement, but I was really astounded by the results. It was as if you just threw the pieces of paper up uh, in the air and picked them up off the floor. One person uh, would have, uh, say, Bob Hope, number one, another guy would have him number 29. Uh, strictly a, a matter, as Groucho says, of personal judgment and taste. Well, it'd be like saying, who's the greatest actor in the world? You can't say that. I mean, there's Gail Good, there's Reese Evans, there's Olivier, there's dozens of fine actors. Rod Steger, all kinds of, you can't say anybody is the best actor. You can't say Steger either. <laughs> Steiger. He can't say Steiger. Steven? Well, Steven, whatever his name is. We have another question here? Yeah, a sensible one this time, huh? <laughs> yeah, I didn't write that for myself. Oh, no, I, uh, I surmise that you had. Right this there. is for Steve Allen. Uh, what is your reason for not using a comedian? Uh, every week. Uh, do you um, disapprove of women doing comedy on a steady basis? No, but his wife does. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, my mother did comedy on a, on a steady basis. They're really, it's just an accident. Uh, we um, do use women from time to time. As a matter of fact, I met uh, a young lady named Carolyn Richter here uh, just a few minutes ago out in the lobby. She's been on the show a few times. We had a young lady on the other night named Dee Arlen. Occasionally we use uh, my mother, his professional name is Belmontros. Uh, it just seems that uh, in general there aren't as many opportunities within the framework of our scripts uh, for uh, female characters. I think a lot of women dislike women comedians because they think it's a kind of a slander on the whole sex. They don't like, a lot of women don't like women to uh, appear ridiculous. Uh, Oh, no, 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 no. Silly, don't you no, agree with that? There's, well, there's one thing that we know, certainly, it's much, much easier to write for male comics than it is for women, and, it, and it's the easy way out, and you get bigger returns. Do comedy shows ever need a laugh track, which is a pretty good switch from what I was trying to say before. <laughs> Henry Morgan made an experiment one time when Henry was uh, at the peak of his popularity. Um, Henry's relationship, I guess, with the studio audience and perhaps the larger audience, too, was never... <laughs> As warm as his 20 in favor of pay TV. All right, get your money up right now. <laughs> uh, Steve Allen, would you be interested in having a comedy workshop on your program on Sunday? Comedy workshop? He has. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We're experiment experimenting every week. Actually, we do. Uh, yes, it's about time you stop experimenting. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we do literally make a lot of experiments. Uh, Nobody is, I guess everybody discovers eventually who's in the field, no one is really an expert on comedy. You go through a stage where you think you are, and it's like studying any field. The, the more you study it, the more you realize the, uh, the fact that what you know is very little compared to what, you, what there is to be known. And uh, we often uh, put uh, sketches or jokes or uh, routines on the air where we really have no idea when all is said and done how they're going to work out. Sometimes our experiments are successful, sometimes they fail. But I think we're making a, a healthy progress in that particular regard. But your show is now on Monday, isn't it? Yeah, well, that was my own decision. It was actually... Fine, Craig doesn't even know what night the show is on. <laughs> no, I... I, I Give us another boat of that over there, will you? <laughs> I moved out of uh, Sunday night because of Maverick. Uh, if I'd only known that Dennis the Menace was coming along, I could have stayed, you know. I have a, one of, I have a, 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 a perfect example, or... Here's a well-adjusted man, and here's a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and here's somewhere right in between. <laughs> I know what he's doing. Oh, I mean, nice I'm making plans right for a new right home out in the valley. valley. <laughs> We're going to put the pool right in there. You see? <laughs> this is for uh, Groucho Marx. Um, do you think it would be possible and beneficial to public taste to have a government art and drama commission control TV uh, to, uh, to improve the quality. 
I think it would be disastrous. I think they've ruined everything they've touched. I think it would be a good idea only if Groucho Marx were at the head of it. <laughs> the average politician would be murdered. Oh. And we put the name Captain Spaulding on the outside of the door. Can you listen to some of those jokers' speeches? Are they going to tell you what's funny and what isn't funny? And what's dramatic and what isn't? I think the government is in too many things. They ought to get out of most of them. <laughs> Such as the income tax. <laughs> By the time they quit that, they went into another business. <laughs> this is for us. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> I've seen you someplace. <laughs> this is for Cecil Smith. You're usually standing under a duck. <laughs> uh, Cecil, for a grown-up man. <laughs>